Um, as Bob said, the, the title of the sermon, if you were to take notes, and that means you should be maybe taking notes, I'm just teasing. Um, I would write across the top of the page, I don't know what I believe, hyphen, more likes. So the two scriptures that we're going to be in today, we're going to be bouncing back and forth between 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, and then you can put your finger back on Matthew chapter 4. So we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, and then we're also going to be in Matthew chapter 4. So, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 through 14, which was the, is going to be the main scriptures throughout our series, I Don't Know What I Believe. So it starts as this, Paul is saying, he has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, and an apostle, and a teacher. That is why I, I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. The verse that I want to focus in on this morning is verse 9. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. The very first verse that Paul says in this verse right here, the very first thing he says is saved and called us. Now, if I were to ask many of you here today to raise your hand if you were saved, I'm not going to do that because... I certainly don't want to embarrass anybody, although I think everybody here this morning is saved. If they would raise their hand, then you know what? I think I'd get those hands raised. But I don't want to do it because everyone's welcome here. And if we were to do that and somebody was here that wasn't saved, then they might feel uncomfortable. And we don't want them to feel as though you have to belong to the group before you can come here. Because that's not what this is really all about. Here at Capital City Church, we want it to be everyone is welcome. Not just because they're part of the club and that we're providing membership services for this club, but we want this to be a place where everyone can come, even if they don't have their lives together. Amen? This is a place where, if I were to say, we like to throw out a lifesaver called Jesus for those of us who maybe don't have it all together. And I don't always have it together. I mean, this week I had a meltdown, you know, over the Thanksgiving dinner. All right? I had a meltdown. I don't always have it together. And so that's really what this is all about. I'm here because Christ is here and because he has called me he saved me and called me to a holy life we don't want it to be membership services we want it to be a place where people can come who are sinking and drowning in the things of the world having lived in the Bible Belt now, I don't know how many of you have ever lived in the South, near the South, but having lived there, 
It was not uncommon for us to hear somebody say, I am so glad I'm saved. And we, of course, being in the Bible Belt, understood what they were saying. And even in the church, if you have that conversation and somebody says to you, Randy, I am so glad that I'm saved. You would kind of understand what that meant, right? But when we moved up here and have the conversation out in the world, they look at you cross-eyed. They kind of know a little bit about it, but, you know, not really. And if we were to live in another part of the world, they would really not understand that faith-based terminology. I am so glad that I'm saved. They might look at you and say, were you in danger? You know, if you lived in Chicago or Milwaukee, they might say, was the mob after you? Or if you lived overseas in a place that had tigers, they might say, was a tiger chasing you? Were, you? were you in danger or something? They don't understand what being saved means. Now, only in the South or in the church does that make any sense. If I were to say to you this morning, how many of you believe that God has saved you by his grace, I am sure, as I mentioned, that many of you would raise your hand high just based on the verse that we read because he saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we've done, but because of Jesus. So I'm sure that you would raise your hand, but if I were to ask it this way, how many of you are living a holy life? Especially if you're sitting next to somebody who knows you. <laughs> Amen? Right? I don't know about this holy life thing. I know that I'm saved. Amen? And I'm saved by grace. And that's only because of what God done. But this holy life thing, I don't know what that's all about. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Okay? We're going to look at this verse again. Let's look at verse 9. Paul says... He, Jesus, God, he has saved us and, so if you could, if you circle and mark your Bible up, I would put a big circle around that and, because it's in the same breath. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. You see how close they are? Gail teaches English, right? together. They love each other. They are holding hands as they're walking down the street. Saved and called us to a holy life. It's not as if Paul wrote it chapters later. Paul didn't write it in chapter 2, he has saved us, not because of anything that we have done. And then chapters later said, and now you're called to a holy life together in one place. So we agreed that we know that we're saved by grace and not because of anything that we've done. But we're not so sure about that holy life. How do you live a holy life? How do you get in there? They're not separated by a comma or a semicolon or anything like that. They're part of the same breath. He saved you and called you to that holy life. And yet so often, you don't always see that. It's separated. It's, it's, it's a part of a different thing. Now, again, living in the South, we had an opportunity to see some of that. What I want to talk about this morning is what keeps us from living a holy life. Because Here's the question, the premise, the thesis, if I were to be in college. This is what it says. If what we're believing isn't affecting who we're becoming, do we really believe? People say, I know what I believe, but if it's not changing me, I know that if I go over to that light switch, and I flip it on, the lights are going to come on. But if I don't ever go over to the light switch to turn it on because it's dark, do I really believe that the electricity is going to come on? I'm going to sit 
sit down and be comfortable, but never sit down on the couch because I don't believe that the couch is going to be there to catch me. Get what I'm saying? If I believe it should be changing the way that I'm living, so what keeps that from happening? Last week was about salvation. The first part, I am saved, right? It's an S word. This week, we're going to add a really complicated word. Only the people in church world might even recognize this word. It's called sanctification. Big church theology word. But really, it's not scary. It's not something that you can't understand. It simply means being set apart. So today, when we're talking about being sanctified, living a holy life, it's not going to be some complicated thing. We're going to be looking at something real. How God has called us to a holy life, sanctified us, separated us away from the things that will harm us. He sets us apart from the things that are <clears throat> contrary to his holy life, to his plan. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to get religious on you, and I know how to be religious. Okay? I'm not going to get religious on, on you because what we learn in here today, we have to be able to take out there. We have to be able to go to work on Monday or go to school <clears throat> or go to the marketplace and take what we've learned out there. So it's not going to be religion. We don't want religion, we want relationship here. So I started to say in the South, we had the opportunity to come in contact with many different denominations because after all, we were in Bible Belt in North Carolina. And, and we've had the opportunity even to talk to different people. And I know of churches who will not. When you talk about worship, oh, we don't have drums. Oh, no, we can't have a keyboard or a guitar or a bass. A bass. Oh, no, I just want the straight word of God. That's all I want is the straight word of God from the Bible. That's all I want. I don't want any of that music, any of that rock and roll stuff, or any of that dancing or raising a hand thing. Just the straight word word of God. And that when you think about that, is it because that if I go to church on Sunday and bear that uncomfortable thing, that maybe, just maybe, God will like me more. He'll be pleased with me this week because I lived this thing called church that's nothing like my real life. I bear this thing called church, and it has to be so separate from my real life. Now, because I, I was in church, God is going to be more pleased with me. That's religion. And I've been in that whole list of legalism, of do's and don'ts, but what we, what I need to realize is that God is not so much worried about taking rock and roll instruments or having fun. He's not, he's not wor worried about that. He's not worried about how we're dressed. He's not worried about taking the church are those things out of the church? What God is really more concerned with, brothers and sisters, is getting more of the church in us. Amen? It's not about this list of things, the way we dress, the way we talk, the terminology that we use. It's not about that. It's about having a real relationship, about getting him into every part of our lives. So today, 
what I want to look at is instead of, you know, instead of being not so much like Jesus, because we're supposed to be like him, right? More like him. I am to be like him. Well, if we're going to be like him, the most holy person who ever walked the face of the earth, what did he do? He came into the world, and he got involved in everything. If our goal is to live a whole, to live more like him, to live a holy life, then we should be like him. To reach out. And instead of standing on the corner or standing in the church or standing on our soapbox, screaming and pointing our fingers at the world saying, you're a sinner. We don't want to do that because that's not what Jesus did. That's not a holy life. So we're going to look at three things today that will keep us from receiving and living in the holy calling that he has called us to, the holy life. So let me ask you this now. We've talked about a couple different things, but if it's so easy for us to believe that he has saved us, why is it so hard for us to believe that we can live a holy life. So the title of the message is More Lives. We're going to talk about three things. So since we're talking about holiness, I thought we would look at Matthew chapter 4. So if you want to flip over to Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to look at Jesus Christ, the most holiest person who's ever walked the face of the Lord. We're going to look back at what Jesus did when he was tempted by Satan. Satan tempted him to abandon his calling. I'm going to give you an example of what more likes would be like. Okay, It's a social media terminology terminology, right? More likes. I want likes, right? You have a Facebook page or a Twitter account or any of those kind of things. You're looking for more likes when you post things, right? So, when we had our Thanksgiving shoot, family photo shoot last year, when all the kids and everybody was here, we had somebody take us out and put the pictures, you know, and so then I wanted to load them up into Facebook. Or, how about when Chris and Emily got engaged? I don't know if you've seen my Facebook account, but I put those, I pasted those all over everything. You know, how many likes am I going to get? How many likes? You know, and I remember going back and, and looking at it and saying, wow, there are so many people, right, that liked it. Or even better, the wedding. That's the most recent example. When I was on there the day after they got married, I went and I looked because they had set up a Twitter thing so whoever took pictures, they could put it on this Twitter account. So whenever I was going back and looking, I was grabbing them and I was putting them on my Facebook. And then I was, I was watching, how many people are seeing this? How many likes have I gotten? Because of all of these pictures, right? Can I suggest to you that if we're living our lives that way, maybe we're living for the wrong likes. So much so that we miss the calling God has put on our lives. So the first thing, that's, and we're in Matthew here, we're going to look at is when Jesus had been fasting. Right? So let's go Matthew chapter 4. It says, Jesus was fasting for 40 days. Satan took the opportunity at this point to come when he was weak, right? The scripture says, after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Duh. <laughs> right? Obvious. He was hungry. He was a human being. And so the tempter came to him and said, if you 
are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. The tempter tries to get the Son of God to fulfill a God-given hunger in an ungodly way. He was telling him, break your fast, turn these stones into bread to fill his hunger. There's his hunger. He was really hungry. In verse 4, though, it says this, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but only on every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, I've got something that's more important to me than what I want at this time. Being hungry and filling my belly is not the most important thing at this moment. It's what Jesus was really saying to him. And, you know, maybe the, the reason why God had this verse in there, which is very obvious, was to point out what was really going on. So that we wouldn't miss this. Jesus was now a superhuman being. He got hungry. But even though he was fully man, he was fully God at the same time. He could have done something about it, about being hungry. He really could have taken those stones and turned them into bread and eaten them and not been hungry anymore. But he didn't. And what I think sometimes, let's apply that to us, sometimes we get so lonely that we compromise our holy calling so that we don't have to feel lonely anymore. Even if it means sexually we get way outside of where God designed that relationship. Doesn't matter. I want what I want at this moment. So I am not going to do what you tell me to do, Father God. We miss the Holy Calling because not of complicated reasons, not because of fancy words or terminologies, just but because I don't want to do what God is telling me to do. That's simple. So, we'll go to the world. We'll turn the stones into bread. And when we wake up hungry again, with a stomach that's not feeling so good, we're sick because of what we've eaten the day before, we wonder what went wrong. Because I love myself more than the purpose that God has for me. So we just got to admit it. It's because of our own evil desires. What does James tell us? In James chapter 1, verse 13, it says that when we are tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. Right? Because God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does he tempt anyone. But, and I like buts in things, because I circle those and I think, well, okay, if there's something, there's got to be something that's important. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their evil, own evil desires and enticed. So it's not because of God, it's just because we got tempted and yet we gave in. Because I like me. We might as well say we're hypocrites. Doesn't the world call us that already? I don't go to church because there's, there, you're all hypocrites. It's true. It's true. I do what I want to do because I want to do it. So I have a funny story to share. Amy's in the nursery. I guess I'm going to over five bucks. <laughs> when we lived in California, we went to a family picnic with our church. Now, Amy is like this tall. I don't know if she was four or five or what she was, but she was little. 
and it was hot, and there were water guns there. So the kids got water guns, and they were all filled up, and then guess what Amy did? Just like everybody else, she was running around having a good time shooting them, but then all of a sudden you heard her hollering, and we're watching this. This is hilarious. Everybody's laughing at it. You can't shoot me with that water because I'm not supposed to get wet. No, you can't shoot me because I can't get wet, but I can shoot you, right? Hypocrite. <laughs> right? That's what we do. You can't have fun because there's no fun in church. You have to be solemn. It looked like you've been weaned on a pickle. Hypocrite. And then we walk out the door and boy, we just have a good old time all week long. Church, real life, and never will the two meet. It's not the way that God designed it. Now I'm going to tell on myself again, because if I can't be real and I can't be transparent, what good is it going to be, right? Well, we have children. Now we're talking military life, but this example, when I was writing this out, the Holy Spirit specifically brought this to my attention, so I thought, okay, now I have to tell them. So here we go. Bob was overseas in Okinawa, Japan, and I was stayed in Jacksonville, North Carolina, um, where we had a trailer, and we had a church family, and I had a job. You know, I was working at a preschool at the church and everything, and so I continued on with my fellowship with everybody. And we had some good friends. I mean, a lot of the single Marines always came over to the house and we fed them and we had a good time and all this kind of stuff. But I was lonely. And I never ever even thought about having an affair. But it was nice that this friend came over. And somebody told me, well, you know, you don't want your good to be evil spoken of. But I then I got off wanted to validate everything that was going on and that he was coming over and all this stuff. But then the devil got in there. See, I was lonely and Bob was halfway across the world and of course we didn't have the kind of phone technology that we do now and it would cost a mere fortune. We bought several appliances with him being on, on phone bills. The devil told me, oh, you can't be thinking those kind of things. You can't be having that kind of friendship. What would your friends at church say if they knew you were having a problem? What would Bob say if you told him? So not was it I was worried about being tempted, it was all about me and how I was going to look and what were people really going to think about me. I was living out that social media thing, more likes. Are they going to really like me? Now, the end of the story is I did tell him what was going on, you know, and that that, that was happening. And once I did, guess what? was not under that pressure anymore. The devil could not torment me over that. Nothing ever did happen. You know? But now I can share and say, don't let the devil do that to you. Don't let him try to dupe you into being worried about what other people are going to think about you. My goodness. You know, it's nice. It's nice to be liked by others, but you know what? It's not worth it. So it brings me to the second point. Sometimes we don't live according to the holy calling because we're living for more likes from others, from other people. That's more important to us. And that's how this example of posting the pictures on Facebook works. 
Don't you like the picture that I posted of our family? Don't you like the food that I made for my family? Shh, I'm trying to post this. Now leave me alone. Don't you like me? Come on, tell me that you like me. Tell me that you like me. If I wear it down to here, are you gonna like me then? If I wear it up to here, will you like me then? Come on, like me, want me, need me. That's what that terminology, that's what that mindset is all about. Living for more likes from others. And if I'm doing that, the quickest way to disrupt God's perfecting process in my life is to try to put out an image of myself that I think other people are going to like. Because then I'm not really me. I'm not really the person that God is calling to me, calling me to be. But that's the world we live in. Right? More likes. Like me. Like me. I, I gotta be liked. So Jesus, going back to our example, he won't turn the stones into bread because his relationship with Father God is way more important than his own desires. So, Satan tries another way. Let's look at verse 5 in Matthew chapter 4. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He said, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up on their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So what's Satan trying to do here? He's trying to get Jesus to prove something. Throw yourself down. Hey, look at me! Look at what I'm doing here. I'm the savior of the world. Look at me. Father God won't let this happen to me because I'm the savior of the world. Can you hear Satan almost saying, boy, you could really win some points on that election, you know, towards that savior thing. They're going to like you more. They're going to think you're really who you say that you are. But Jesus didn't live for that. He wasn't worried about what other people thought about him. That was not his motivation. He did not have to prove anything because he was the Son of God. He lived to please the one who sent him. The one he came from and the one he belonged to. So Jesus in verse 7 responds this way. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now I think here it's impossible for us to really pursue holiness in our own lives if all we're about, all of our obsession is focused on presenting an image of ourselves. That's going to be important to others. Not so much in what God thinks. So if I'm focusing on who I think people should think I am, there's no room left over to focus on what God is calling me to. More likes. So with our example of social media, of Facebook, I think a lot of people, and I've done this. I, when, when I was thinking, of, I've done this. When we have those pictures from the wedding, they live refresh. What happens? Refresh. How many people have liked me now? They live in the mentality, refresh, refresh, refresh. I've got to know who likes me, who's like me, who put a comment out there. You know, where am I at? What's going on? But don't get caught up in this example of Facebook or Twitter or whatever, uh, Instagram. We don't want to get caught up in that. How about this? We can find other ways to live for approval. 
The Bible tells us that we should love others. And is it part of loving others, not gossiping? Not slandering? So, we find ourselves in a conversation with someone, and we want to impress that someone. We want to look big in their eyes. And we know something about somebody else that if I were to say it, I would be very impressive. And so, because I want to be liked and thought well of, I go ahead and say this thing that's going to harm that other person, not thinking about what's going to do them, but I'm going to be liked. I'll get a pat on the back. I'm going to look good in front of these people. If I'm throwing myself out there in front of everybody and saying, like me, want me, don't you need me around? How can we do what the scripture says about when we're having a conversation, season your conversation with salt for the uplifting, for the benefit of others? If we're so worried about being liked, how can we live according to that scripture? How can our conversations be seasoned with salt? How can we only speak what is helpful in building up? So I've got an example of a picture, and I think Richard has gone. Did Richard show you the, the uh, thing that I want up? Don't put it up yet. This was this, this kind of, this thing went viral in September. There was this dad who uh, had a daughter who had been disrespectful to his wife, to her mother, been disrespectful to him, and was wearing things that were just not very good, right? If I wear it down to here, will you like me then? If I wear it up to here, will you like me then? And the dad kept trying to tell the daughter, honey, if you wear that stuff, they're not really, and they like you for that, they're really not going to love you. They're really not the kind of guy that you want to be involved with, but she was not having any of it. So they were getting ready to go out for dinner to the local hibachi house, okay? And he heard his wife tell it, the daughter, honey, I want you to go change and put something else on, and there was a great big resounding no. <clears throat> so daddy got an idea. And he ran upstairs to his room, and he pulled out an old pair of jeans. And he said, ah, I'm going to teach her. And he, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, put the picture up there. Can you see it? He, he altered the, his clothes to look like something she would wear. Cut them way up, let the pockets hang out, you know. He's got that little slit there in the front. you see it? Yeah, really bad. Okay, go ahead and take it down. So, but see, he didn't want to, we don't want to look at that anymore, right? So what he did, though, is they not only went to the hibachi grill, they went and played miniature golf. <laughs> and he was dressed like that. And then they went and had dessert at an ice cream shop. Okay? And, you know, it, it, the whole idea at the end of the thing was not necessarily to embarrass his daughter, but to prove a point. Because she wasn't seeing what she looked like. His comment was that at the end of the day, my daughter knows that I love her enough to make a fool out of myself. That I'll do anything for her so that she knows just how much I love her. The object lesson, well, lots of people were taking pictures and photobombing and all that kind of stuff, you know, just trying to get in there so they could put that thing out. He was, it, when I pulled it up and I looked at it, he was on like the local news and all these, there's all sorts of different sites that have this thing. It, went, it really literally did go viral. But the point was, is at the end of the night, even though she didn't say, Dad, I got it, you're the best dad ever. <laughs> She's always going to know that he loved her enough to make a fool out of himself. 
So we could possibly argue the parenting techniques. I certainly don't think I want to try that, right? But the point is, is that the, the message, the content of what he was saying was very important. Love will make you act crazy, will make yourself a fool in front of others. Love will make you walk away from conversations. Because, oh, wait, no, I don't need to hear that. I don't need to be a part of that because that's not good for me if I'm hearing that. But then, how many of you have ever, when you tried to walk away from something like that, have heard under the breath, oh, she just thinks she's somebody else. You know, I don't, I don't think I'm all that in the baby chips, right? I think that was a really old terminology thing. Right, Mariah? All that in a bag of chips, right? No, I don't think that, but I do know this, that I love someone who loved me enough to come and die for me, to save me from my sin. And I love him enough not to get caught up in all of that trivial stuff that will affect my relationship with him. Amen? It's not worth it. I love him too much. I don't want to be obsessed with all those kind of things. He saved me. And he called me. And my focus needs, and I'm going to say needs, because it's not always on him. I'm, I want to stand here with you and say, holy life, right? My focus needs to be on him and not what everybody else thinks of me. Not what everybody else likes. So let's go back to what Paul wrote in Timothy. Paul is writing from prison. And he's saying, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to suffer for the one who wasn't ashamed to die for me. And in verse 12 it says, that, that is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. No amount of loneliness. No amount of, of likes is going to cause me to compromise my relationship with him. So Jesus said to Satan, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to turn the stones into bread. I'm not going to get up there, and I'm not going to do something in front of them to make them look at me. And that brings us to the third point. The third thing that is probably the, one of the most destructive things to living a holy life, and this might surprise you, because the first two things make complete sense, right? It says, don't live for others, live for God. Don't live for yourself. Don't live for yourself, don't live for others, live for God. And we talked about that religion thing. I find that religion can be destructive, and I know it firsthand. It can just be destructive to living a holy life. More destructive, or just as destructive, as sin can be. Because I cannot live a holy life if I'm living for more likes. If in my mind, and I want you to follow this, if in my mind I have this thought, when I am better, then, so if I'm better, then God will like me more, I'll never get better. Right? Or, if in my mind, if I can quit this thing, then God will like me more, then I'm never 
going to have the power to quit this thing. And now, since I can't quit this, and I don't think that God likes me, then I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to let God get into my life. Because who wants to spend time with someone you don't like? You see the mindset? And this is where religion comes in, okay? The devil in verse 13, since he realized that he wasn't going to give in to for himself, living for himself, he wasn't going to give in to living for others, he said in verse 13, Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and says, all this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. So listen to this. Going, listen, this is going to change your life. Religion says, I will give you all these things if you bow down and worship. That's what religion says. I know you've heard it. But God says this. Our God says, all this I have given to you. Now, bow down and worship me. What he gave to us was not because he, we had done something, right? It's not because of anything that we had done, but because he loved us first. So, totally different. You are holy, so be holy. God has already made you that. You are loved, so walk in love. Look at, ver look at our verse in 2 Timothy again. He has saved us, and this is where this comes from. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Unmerited favor. Because of grace. And this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Before you could ever do anything to earn a light from God, he had already given it to us in Christ Jesus. Most people will see it like this. He has saved us not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And now that he has called us, because of everything that he did, and now he's called us to live a holy life by all of our own virtues and strength and efforts. Kind of what, you know, we when we first started going to church in the South, it was... We had to sign a membership card. And on this membership card, it said all these things that we couldn't do if we were going to be a part of the club. No smoking, no drinking, no playing cards, no dancing, no running with those that do, and a few other wonderful things. You know, I can remember the pastor making comments about the clothes that some of the young teachers wore and how they wore their makeup. But then sometimes he would say, well, if they didn't wear makeup, I don't think we'd want to be a church, you know, because there were some holiness churches in the South that said you had to grow your hair long and you couldn't wear any makeup and you couldn't do all these things. That's not what this is saying. This is saying that he gave it to us before the beginning of time, before we could earn a like, that grace that holy calling was already given to us. So that's why, because they think it's the other way, that we see the separation in our lives. Here's church, and here's my holy life. Because they think that they can't attain it. But here's the point. Neither of these things in this verse is because we've earned it. God has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done. 
Jesus says, I love you. So now, worship me because I've already loved you. There's nothing else that you need to do. So what does Jesus say after Satan tries to get him to fall for that? He says to him, verse 10, 11, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then, this is really important, the devil left him and angels came and attended to him. So what gave Jesus the strength to do this? I would say, let's go back just one chapter to chapter 3 and what went on there? This is really early in Jesus' ministry. I don't think he's really done anything at this point because in chapter 3 is Jesus' baptism. Nothing had happened up to that point. And so he goes to John and he says, John, I want to get, I want to be baptized. And John, you know, he profusely says, I don't need to be baptized in you. I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus tells him, no, I need to do that because it's to fulfill righteousness. It's for righteousness sake, I need to do this. I need to be an example. So we see Jesus go down into the water. And then it says, and I, John, John saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and coming over Jesus. And then he heard a voice from heaven that said, this is my son, <clears throat> whom I love. With him I am well pleased. I might say that the key to living a holy life and becoming more like Jesus is not getting more likes from God through our behavior, it's becoming more aware of how much he loves us. How much love he already has for us. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. It's becoming more aware of him. We think if I could be more like Jesus, then I'd be more pleasing to God. But God says back, no, that's not how it works. What does the verse say? It says, with him I am pleased. Well, that's Jesus. So then I can't be. No. Let's go back to 2 Timothy. Because in 2 Timothy it says, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So, if I'm in Christ, let's follow this reasoning out, if I'm in Christ, then he is pleased with me. If I'm in Christ and God is pleased with him, then he is pleased with me. Doesn't that free you up a bit? He's, he's pleased with me. Not because of anything that I have done, because I have not done a lot of things. But because he is pleased with Jesus. And the Jesus that's in me. So who do you have to please? Now that doesn't mean that we don't live for him. That doesn't mean that we don't live our lives as a sacrifice pleasing to him because all of those things are true, but it's not because I want to earn the likes. It's because I love him and he loves me. Total way of, look, different way of looking at this. I'm trying to be more like Christ. And I'm not trying to be more like Christ to get those likes from God. It's because I'm becoming more aware of his love for me. So I bow down because he's already given me his love. Already have it.
be what he calls you and I to be. Holy. I can't get him to like me more. I can't get him to love me more than he already does. But I can be more like him as I stand in his love for me. When Jesus took a dip in the Jordan River, he wasn't doing it to get more likes from God. He was doing it because 